at Nahai Gansak. Katabatash Katantwa Wuchi Wunikisak Kawami Nawia Nakan Wuni Tiawank. Welcome all my friends and relatives to the homelands of the Narragansett Nation. I am Loren Spears, the Executive Director of Tomaquag Museum. My traditional name is Makasini Pachau, and I am very thankful to the creator for this beautiful day and all the beauty that surrounds us. As I welcome you and bless this day, we must acknowledge the 400 years of conquest, colonization, genocide, land dispossession, enslavement, forced assimilation, detribalization, and the erasure of the Narragansett and other indigenous nations of the Americas. We must also acknowledge the bravery, resilience, perseverance, and adaptability of our ancestors who ensured our continuation, passing forth our traditional ecological knowledge, language, history, culture, while contributing to the creation of this colony, state, and country. There is no US history without indigenous people's history, and there is no Rhode Island history without Narragansett, Niantic, and other indigenous people's history. This is our homeland since time immemorial. We are still here. May we always remember we are the land. What we do to the land, we do to ourselves. We must care for Mother Earth to ensure our future generations. A land acknowledgement is just the beginning and we must follow it by actions. That is why we established the Indigenous Empowerment Network and represent the museum's exhibits and programs from a first person perspective. Katabatash Akwane Ka Nantam. Thanks, peace and blessings. Now I would like to introduce to you E. Pierre Morinon. Pierre Morinon is a professor emeritus of anthropology at Rhode Island College, a former director of the public archaeology archaeology program. He also serves as a commissioner on the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission. Everyone, please join me in welcoming today's guest, Pierre Morinon. So I will- Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. We're thrilled to have you. Um, even though the topic today is a little um, more heavy, we're certainly um, pleased and grateful for your um, perseverance in, in, in documenting this work so that we can have these discussions and we can share the full history of our, our experience here in this place. So I would love to start with um, what might seem like a simple question, but I'm sure is loaded. What inspired you to write this book, Rediscovering Lost Innocence, Archaeology at the State Home and School? Well, I have to I have to say <clears throat> that uh, I was not prepared to do this. Um, I did not <clears throat> undertake this work uh, with with expectation, or, nor nor even with with training. Which is, you know, we often find ourselves in that situation. But you know, I I was trained as a <clears throat> conventional archaeologist. Um, I started working out west in New Mexico and Texas um, and uh, places like North Carolina <clears throat> and then came came to Rhode Island um, in 1979 to undertake the, the work that you mentioned in the public archaeology program. We did a tremendous amount of applied research um, all in Rhode Island uh, for um, about about 20 years. Um, and uh, that that was really my training and background. So I'm I'm kind of a, an applied researcher. Uh, I'm very much dedicated to historical preservation, and uh, um, I, I will tell you more. I think in a bit about how this project got going. But um, really, I I was I was not trained to do what. What I what I have done in this project, and I don't think anyone working on this project, um, including um, you know social workers, uh, historians, um, members of the public, you know people who were actually at this at this, I don't think any any of us were really prepared for this work. Um, so it it's kind of a I, I would say at this point it was an act of love <laughs> um, that uh, that brings me here. I don't so, know if that answers, answers your question. Sure. 
I, but, I think that that's definitely helpful. And anything that you forget, don't worry. You have plenty of time. You can weave it back in. Um, I'm wondering why the title you chose, Rediscovering Lost Innocence. All right. Well, I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to try to um, bring up this. Um, so I, I, I hope people can see this. Um, Oh, can you see this? Yes, it's it's up there. Um, <clears throat> well, it's it's an odd it's an odd title, um, and we have to think of these words as as really um, having kind of complex different meaning. I want you to sort of imagine um, imagine if you were to go upstairs into the attic of, uh, let's say, your grandparents or your parents or, or, or somebody you didn't know, and you found a box. And in that box, you opened it up, and there were these records, papers, videotapes, photographs, all sorts of things. Um, and when you began to look through them, <clears throat> it uh, changed the way you saw things in the world. Um, so we, I didn't want to use the word rediscovering um, or discovering because, I, you know, as an archeologist, we really actually don't discover many things, particularly in North America. Um, what we encounter are things that people already know about. Um, so we, we're sort of rediscovering them in some ways. Uh, and the idea of lost innocence, um, if you look at the photograph here, let me just, if you look at that photograph, I, I guess you could say that lost innocence is about children. Um, but it's also about, well, in, in, my, in my case, it's, I, I lost some innocence, so. And I think many of us working on this project, and we started out very innocent. And as we got into it, um, we lost that innocence. So, but I, I would like, there's a question on the photo um, and I would like the audience to uh, answer that question. What do you in the audience notice about these developments? Reactions in the chat, please. Yes, right. Um, I know this is a bit odd. I, I should be talking about it. I want to know what the audience sees. Imagine that you've opened up this box and you find this. This is a postcard that was created. Um, it's kind of an odd thing to imagine that a element, you know, a, a school scene like this would be mailed all around Rhode Island and the country. Um, but that's true. So do we have any, any takers? There are no right or wrong answers. This is not a trick question. <laughs> I'm just curious what, what audience members notice. Well, I noticed that it's set up like a very typical classroom, how we might envision our own selves when we were in elementary school sitting in a row, you know, in the rows and, um, and, and taking the, the photograph. Um, there's an, a comment in the chat, the solemnity, I can't get the word out, of, of their faces, the solemnness, I guess, of their faces. All the children look stoic and not joyful is another. <laughs> That's comment. true. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're stoic. Um, you know, I, I sort of think it, in this time period, for some of these children, this may have been the first time they were ever photographed. I don't know if you've ever um, thought about ancient old photographs, but people, when they were first photographed, often have these kind of strange looks on their faces. Um, but what else? Other comment that, in general, the males seem to be on the top. Well, yeah, I mean... Yeah. And there's uh, another comment. It looks like the fund appeals one gets from schools or religious missions <laughs> for the benefit of attracting donors. 
Right. And then also um, children of various backgrounds, the child in the lower left seems to wear a serapi, but predominantly white. Um, children without parents. Right. Well, that, I, I, I think, um, these are all these are all children, of course, at one time had children, but, but they're all in state custody. They're all in state custody. I mean, this is uh, the state home was a custodial institution. So these are not children uh, coming from homes going to school. These are children that are uh, held in state custody and uh, are attending a school um, at the state institution. Couple more comments that went with it. There are way more boys than girls, two to one or three to one, possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on a small screen, it seems to be multiracial class. Yeah. Yeah. And so the time period, that's pretty remarkable. Right. So um, state institutions, um, if, if you were to go to the to look at current state institutions that hold children, you'd find pretty much the same ratio, boys two to one. So how about um, you let us know a little bit more, why don't you describe the state home and school for us? Yeah, let me just, um, just raise this one question. Um, do any of you see indigenous children here? You can give thumbs up or thumbs down, I think with the reaction buttons. Yeah. People often will comment, because I've done this many times, People will often comment, oh, it's odd to see a, uh, you know, a multivaried or multiracial or diverse group of students. You know, you wouldn't think that a state institution would hold, um, but they're holding, they're holding children that are from Rhode Island. So this, look, this is a look of Rhode Island in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, um, we, we can't a actually answer my question as, 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 you know, to be honestly honest with you because um, indigenous children were not recorded in state records. So after um, 1880, no state records describe native children. Um, so I asked this as a hypothetical. The answer, so, I'm sorry, Pierre, someone did comment possibly, but you can't just tell by looking. Right, you can't. You cannot tell. You cannot only tell, but you also can't state, find out by state records. So that if, if I, for example, had a state record on each of these children, um, it would not tell us anything about their ethnicity. And That's I'm wondering if anyone in the audience knows why there's no record of the indigeneity of the child after 1880 in this state school. So they may not know this, but I'm going to go ahead and give them go for it. <laughs> is that the Narragansett tribal nation was detribalized in the detribalization roles were from 1880 to 1882. And so from that point on, we're written out of existence. Yeah. And this institution was established by law in 1884, an interesting coincidence. And no the first and the, and the first children arrived at this institution the next year, 1885. A, a remarkable thing to think that a state could create an institution and in the next year actually it was there. So um, so we don't know, um, but we'll we'll get into that. I, I think another thing to notice, you know, is is if you look at the clothing, you'll see, for example, that the boys generally have ties. Generally, if you look at the lower lower, they have ties or some kind of covering around their neck, and the girls generally are wearing dresses, which is you know the case. I am amazed at Isabel Armstrong, who is the tall woman in the middle up there. You notice how she's dressed; she has a tie. And uh, so I think there's some interesting issues here about uh, um, just status and role and gender that, that are, are revealed that, you know, for people who are interested in those kinds of things, why would she choose to wear a tie? Um, and, and part of the answer to that is that, you know, 
women finding jobs like this, you know, teaching in a in this case in a in a school, um, that that was that was a pretty privileged uh, position for her, um, and she wanted she wanted to sort of exhibit that. Um, I like to think that she was actually trained at the Rhode Island State Normal School um, as a teacher, which is just down the road in Providence. And uh, um, this may have been her first job, but I don't know much about her. So you asked about, about the institution and um, let me just try to put this in some sort of context. <clears throat> So as I said, in you know 1884, by law, this institution was created, and it was actually first people arrived in 1885, um, and it lasted until um, 1979. So when I arrived at Rhode Island College in 1979, this particular institution was just closing down. Um, and I've, I've listed all of the other state institutions that were sort of created um, in, the, in the late 1800s, and you can see the Rhode Island State Normal School, that is Rhode Island College now, um, the State Farm, the State Asylum. But then I've highlighted institutions for children, and you can see the Oak Lawn School for Girls and the Sakonasset School for Boys, ah, 1882. Interesting. Uh, then the State Home, 1885, and then the Rhode Island School, which was called for the feeble-minded that became later the Exeter School and the Ladd Center, um, that's in 1908. So a lot of institutions, the ACI, um, and, and if you look carefully, you'll see, for example, that Oak Lawn School for Girls and Sokanas School for Boys became the Rhode Island Training School. And, uh, um, you know, the state prison and province jail became the ACI, Max. So a lot of the institutions around Rhode Island that we are struggling with right now um, were created in this time period. So there's something interesting going on in the late 1800s that would uh, charge up the state of Rhode Island to do all of these things. Um, and uh, let me just go on here for a second. Um, I know people can't read this, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the huge number of, of institutions in the early, 18, early 1900s that were devoted to taking care of children that were considered destitute uh, or um, poor or neglected. Um, you know, so you have St. Andrew's School, for example, or St. Andrew's um, Industrial School in uh, Barrington, which is now St. Andrew's School. And you have a variety of other institutions. And then there's the state home, which I've kind of highlighted. And you can see there were only a hundred and, you know, there weren't that many students there, uh, 132 of children, but the budget, $21,000. I mean, that, that was a lot of money. <laughs> um, and you can see that the number of workers, paid workers, you know, in the 30s, you, if you just contrast that with, with the Catholic institutions and Episcopal institutions, pretty amazing. Um, this, this was a, a big time institution um, with a lot of capital behind it. Um, and so there it is, State Home. It was constructed, it was built in right on the outskirts of, of Providence. And if you were to look at what's there now, you would see that it's Rhode Island College. So that's, that's where Rhode Island College is today. So um, that state institution, um, the East Campus of Rhode Island College is that state institution. And there's the state normal school I mentioned. So I like to think of that teacher just taking this, you know, the tram up Smith Street uh, to go to work. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that's about it. That's, so that's, I mean, I think that's enough background at, at this point. I don't know, um, we could talk about some other things perhaps. Well, you, you know, um, one of the questions that was asked was why did Rhode Island open the state home in 1885? And I'm wondering what your thoughts and perspectives are about that. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I know from the, the state's perspective, what, what they would say, um, th this, was a, <clears throat> this was a record from the mid 1850s 
early eight, or 1850s, uh, there was this amazing study done um, and by, by this guy, Thomas Hazard. He studied all of the uh, asylums uh, in, in Rhode Island. So it was, oops, sorry. Um, and this is just Smithfield. Uh, if I if I put if I put providences up, it would be just would fill a page. Um, but you can see um, the children were just uh, merged with other people and kept in various buildings um, around Rhode Island. And Hazard was incredibly critical. I mean, it was just a terrible situation. The children were just poorly taken care of. And this particular um, work was really, I think, the sort of empirical justification for why the state needed to do something. So that, that's from the state's point of view. The children who were from destitute families, from families that were, uh, you know, were, which were broken in various ways, had intemperate, um, husbands or whatever, they, they needed better care than just to be kept in, uh, locked in uh, cramped quarters, or in some cases kept in corn cribs. I mean, it's just unbelievable how they were, how they were handled. Um, this, by the way, this particular study also includes a, 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 an older version of a document published in the mid 1830s on the Narragansett. And so what Hazard did is he took an older document that had already been published and he linked it into his study. Um, and so uh, it's pretty clear that based on Hazard's work that the Narragansett uh, tribe uh, really needed some help here. Um, and that's sort of a, 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 I don't know, for people who are social scientists, this document, this study is incredibly good. I, I don't wanna go on about that. Uh, so, I could get just go off into it. it's it's a, it's brilliant as a study. I mean, to imagine that you would send out questionnaires to every institution and then actually go and visit them and study them. I mean, this guy really did a thorough. So it's a very accurate, precise work. Yeah. So you know, I, I hear the goal of the state in their goal right, that's of the state. you know helping. Um, right. destitute families, but they neglect, neglect right. to say, in some cases, they create, not some, most cases, they created the system in which they would become destitute if you take away the land from the indigenous people and they have now no land that's considered their own, then where do they live? And so then, right. and, and, and so that creates the destitution. Um, yeah, that's not, that kind of- solve that, the problem by creating this home which funds their economy at the detriment of indigenous people in this case. Yeah, I, I, put, I put up this slide here of, uh, um, if, you, if you were to actually look at who the key figures were behind the creation of this law and this institution, it's women. It's women, um, you know, the governor, of Rhode Island at the time, you know, acknowledged that, you know, without the pressure of women like Elizabeth Buffum Chase, this institution wouldn't have been created. I mean, they, they just petitioned the heck out of the state and visited and, and pressured their law, you know. Um, and, and so I, I include this, this uh, statement by Elizabeth Buffum Chase, um, because this was her thinking that she thought children who were in tough situations really um, deserve care and uh, could be um, come, a, as, as she says, a blessing, not a burden to the state. So yeah, it's not, it's not that we're trying to, in, in her words, civilize, <laughs> but we're trying to make good citizens. And she was, um, She's a, a woman worth knowing about because she was active in, um, you know, anti-slavery work. She was active in um, labor, so she was really a, a worker that uh, supported unions. Um, she created 
I think maybe the first kindergarten. So she's very interested in, you know, creating institutions so that uh, women could work. Um, and in, in the later part of her life, she became interested in, in short work. Um, so so one of, our, one of our, our visitors, Betsy, um, comments that uh, Elizabeth Buffum Chase was a member of the Providence Friends Meeting until she either resigned or was pushed out in the in the 1840s because she was too radical and abolitionist. Right. Her husband remained a member. So right. that's an interesting little tidbit there. Um, yeah, she was a she she came from a, a, a good Quaker background. Um, but right, I think she she felt that they were um, perhaps too cautious, not active enough. You know the timing of all of this is is really um, key, you know, detribalization here with the Narragansett people, the uh, termination era, um, as you go westward, and the, the laws that created allotments, the Dawes Act, and things like that, that took place. Um, these are these are all connected, you know, this school in Rhode Island, even though not part of the federal system, part of the state systems that took place is um, connected to the federal boarding schools um, and the exhibit that we have at URI away from oh, yeah. is the name of it. Um, and so, of course, you know, in the context of the federal government, it's civilizing the, the natives, um, you know, as Pratt said, kill the Indian, save the man. Um, and the idea was uh, creating useful citizens. But if you really look at it more deeply, it's really around the taking of land, the, the, um, the school, the state school happens right as the Narragansett nation is being detribalized by the state of Rhode Island. And it took 101 years to correct that wrong with federal recognition and acknowledgement um, in 1983. Right. Well, the, the Land know, Settlement Act in 1978, you know, all of these things are connected to each other. And, and certainly, it's always around the the taking of the land to create the resource that was necessary, um, yeah. I guess, to create this country um, in the way that they did. But um, it's, you know, there's very difficult um, perspectives on this. You know, people turn into quote unquote burdens, but it was of the design to create the poverty. Yeah, well, I think one of the, important things that I would like to emphasize and, and particularly in if you if you think about the exhibit at URI it's 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 talking about you know federal undertakings and there is a tendency I think for people to think okay Carlisle school these various schools this is something that was there's something that was done out west right I mean you you read about the, the boarding school schools in Canada and, and you know, often done through religious institutions. And okay, this is something that was done by, you know, and it's, what, what I find particularly important about the work we have done is, it, is this is a state institution. So I, I think that, you know, in, in re-examining what has happened to tribal people around the country, um, we, we need to also look at what, was going on very locally you know what was the state of florida doing you know you know what what was the state of pennsylvania doing what was new york doing what you know well here we have an institution in rhode island and we can we can examine what was this institution doing um and you, you know it's it's a very subtle kind of thing right because you are you are basically taking children out of homes and, and putting them into state custody. And in many cases, um, this did provide some benefits, right? I mean, children, for example, I mean, one of the people we talked with, I remember, remember the story about how he survived by essentially raiding milk uh, containers that were left on people's front doors. You know, at people's front doors, um, 
or the, the woman who told us that the first time she'd ever eaten three meals in her life was when she came to, she didn't even realize that you ate three meals a day. Um, this was not part of her experience. So you, you have that side of this argument. And, and I, this is one of the things I found so interesting about, about your exhibit, because you have testimony from people saying, well, it did provide some, you know, provided us with some education, um, health, uh, so, so there's that side of it, but then there's the other side of it, which, which often goes unacknowledged, but, but you're separating families. You're destroying communities. <laughs> um, and this is part of the equation that often gets ignored. Yeah, um, which is why we're hosting the Away From Home. And, you know, it also depends on the time period of exactly. boarding school as to whether it was a benefit or a detriment. And, and I would say that that was certainly true to the state school yes. in that in, in many ways, the circumstance of poverty was created for the people that are attending by force in many cases that school. And so I think, you know, it, it's a very complicated story and I'm so happy that you're here so that we can have this conversation. Um, there are a couple of comments um, in the chat that kind of might go along with what we're going to um, go to next. Um, yeah, I, I do want to talk more about the sort of what happens sort of historically to, to indigenous children, but yeah, before, that's the what's state, funny. before the stay home, but yeah, let's, let's, let's get the, what people are saying. Sure. So um, someone was commenting on Elizabeth, uh, Buffum Chase as being one of their heroes. Um, mm -hmm. So that was interesting. But uh, the rest of the comment is she also resigned from a number of government appointed lady boards of visitors and refused to be reappointed after the governor failed to listen to their recommendations for the treatment of women and children. So there is certainly that idea that people are trying to do good, but often we're, we're not aware of the bigger picture of what's taking place in the systems of power. Um, so I think that um, there was another comment here about also deported in quotes, a lot of urban kids on orphan trains to find good homes in the West, mm -hmm. um, you know, such, you know, amazing or powerful stories of history. Um, and then in the oral histories taken at the state home and school, we see great ranges of opinion in the assessment of the home on the part yeah. of the residents. And that's kind of what we were talking about. So let's get into, um, from your research and your experience, um, what was your perspective on how you think Rhode Island treated indigenous children? Um, right. You know, right. And, you know, that, I mean, it may be that you're going beyond just the state school, but the, the state and colony as a whole. So, let's yeah, yeah, well, I, 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 you know, I, as a, as sort of a traditional archaeologist, have spent a lot of time reading things like Roger Williams, because, you know, his early comments, particularly um, in his key to the language, you know, has had a lot of influence on the way, at least we archaeologists and anthropologists think about what, what life was like, let's say, in 1635, 1636. And, and so when I went and started looking at, at Williams in terms of well, what did he have to say about Native American children, I, I, I found a few you know, interesting pieces. Um, so there is a word in the Narragansett language for, according to Williams, uh, fa fatherless children. Um, and so that I found interesting. Um, but often Williams would do something like uh, have a little aside or insert something because, you know, go on a little bit more. And, and so he, in, in association with this word, he says, there are no beggars amongst them, nor fatherless children unprovided for. I, I can only assume that Williams was perhaps surprised or a little baffled by this, you know, that this was something that he thought people should know about, that, gee, this particular group of people here living near me, uh, they provide for their fatherless children. And uh, 
Um, so, so this idea of having children that would be uncared for by their family certainly was an, I would say was an alien thought. Um, the idea that humans would do that, that they would actually not take care of their kin, I think was yeah. probably an alien thought, uh, at least at the start when Roger Williams arrived. And then here's another little quote, which is a little interesting. Um, so Williams visited this home and um, wanted some water. Um, and this eight-year-old child um, was asked by his father to fetch and uh, the boy refused and wouldn't stir. So Williams tells the father, I would correct my child. So, you know, this is a sort of like, um, you know, use the stick. And, and so the, you know, the father picks up the stick and uh, Williams concludes at the end that um, these people are too indulgent. Um, and I think that's, to me, um, from what I've known from looking at Algonquin groups all around New England and Canada, that um, I wouldn't use the word indulgent, <laughs> um, but, but children were given a lot of freedom, you know? Um, and this, this idea was, again, an alien thought to, to, it didn't fit in certainly with Western Christian values of, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. Um, so that's how I see, you know, sort of the, the, the beginnings of, of kind of disputed views of how children should be treated. You know, on one side, uh, children should be um, corrected, you know, even punished. On the other side, not so. Um, so when you, when you move on, um, I, I just, put up some information here about the consequences of the King Philip's War. So one of the consequences of the King Philip's War was that all children under the age of five should serve until they're 30. So you have to think about this war in which the Narragansett tribe and, and other tribes um, were um, essentially defeated, um, and what happened? What happened to those people? Um, well, the children were put into indentured servitude, slavery, uh, until they were 30. <laughs> um, older people weren't treated so harshly. Um, you know, if you were over 30, you only served seven years. Um, so that that's the late 1600s. This, is, this would therefore be the experience theoretically of every child. That's pretty harsh. Um, and, and here's what children were worth. You know, wool, three fats, you know, um, not very much um, for 30 years. Now, here's a, a study that <clears throat> Herndon and Ellis Sikato, uh, who was a Narragansett historian, wonderful woman. Um, it's a study that they did of pauper's apprenticeship um, up until 1800. So this is work, the study of 14 towns. And uh, you can see the numbers of Anglo-American boys, Indian and African-American boys, and so forth. Um, there were a lot of children um, that were held as indenture and particularly um, people that were either Indian or African-American. Um, the, the reason that the data is collapsed Indian and African-American boys is again, because the records were so bad. You couldn't, you know, you look at town records, you couldn't tell. Um, based on how people kept records, how to describe people. Um, and so you get something which is not as accurate as we would like, but you can 
rest assured, I think, that indigenous children uh, were indentured for sure. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to your slide about um, jails. You know, we're talking about the school to jail pipeline today, still, you know, a couple hundred years later. And, and, and we're still, we'll, we're still dealing with these same kinds of situations yeah. that are well, subjugating certain groups of people. Well, I will show you in a, in a few minutes a record from the state home. Um, and you will see the word um, indentured in it. Um, so it, we know at least up until 1926, children were described as indentured in the state records. Yes. Um, and so, they, went to, they went into people's houses and families and went to work. Um, they were indentured. I, you know, I don't know if they thought about indenturing in quite the same way as they did in the 1750, but it's there. So I'm, I'm kind of being mindful of the time because it's, it's like 13 minutes to seven. And, and I think we have quite a few slides to still go through. So I'm wondering if you might combine in uh, sort of the design of the state home and institution so people could have a little understanding of that. And, sure. then, um, and then you can maybe go from there and see where we land. I could just fly through some stuff and yeah, there's a lot of visual information. So this is what the institution looked like in 1908. You can see the school and the various cottages and there's a hospital, kind of a circular design uh, with the mansion house, which is where the superintendent stayed right in the center. Um, very, a very familiar kind of, kind of design, kind of like, uh, uh, you know, a Rhode, Rhode Island town. And, and th this is what these, uh, these, buildings that they stayed in looked like. They were cottages, you know, quite different from some of the boarding schools. Uh, but this cottage design was, was very popular in England. Um, and so right in front of you, cottage D was for girls. And uh, none, of these, none of these buildings exist anymore, but we did study them. Um, and here's the school. And that building doesn't exist anymore. Off to the right, you see two older men. There's the superintendent and his, and his son. Uh, and again, you can look at the girls um, who went to the school and the same, you can draw the same generalizations about what you see as you saw elsewhere. Um, and here's where they came from. And you can see that um, every town is there. Uh, I highlighted foreign because uh, sometimes people think that, uh, you know, people who come from foreign countries are a burden. Um, but in fact, all of the, well, almost all of the children came, were Rhode Islanders. Um, and uh, it's just important to emphasize. And they, you know, they did come from other states, but mostly from Rhode Island. Oops, sorry. Um, Here's what the institution looked like in the 1950s. It had grown. So the yellow buildings there were the ones that I showed you before, but then you have all these other buildings that are added. So as the, as the institution grows, it kind of keeps the same design. Um, so this project did start innocently. Um, a fellow by the name of, of uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, my brain is, uh, yeah. Um, so a guy by the name of Richard Hillman, I'm sorry, Richard, <laughs> Dick, um, he, uh, he encouraged us to take a look at this institution. Um, I went out and walked over the ground, found this toy to tow truck and told Richard that this was a really important place that needed to be studied. I mean, the evidence for children was just so overwhelming on the surface that as an archeologist, uh, the work just had to be done. And so we did do archeology, span I'll just go through this, you know, and a lot of the stuff we find are just, you know, buttons and pennies and marbles and various things. Um, 
but but then you find things like parts of a toy tr car or a, um, a religious medallion um, or this particular swan pl plate here, which is a, a craft product. And you find roller skate wheels. So you begin to get a sense of what was going on at this institution. And of course, we found lots and lots of marbles. Um, and, and the marbles were interesting because there were so many of them that helped us put together things like where the playground was and where play areas were. So you could see that around these buildings, many of which don't exist anymore, you could find out where the children played. Um, and there was one building that was left. This is the cottage in 2001. It was kind of a wreck. But again, there are bits and pieces of it that are really interesting. This was built with four inch risers. This was, this was a building that was designed for children. You know, there's a, there's a children's closet here. Um, we began to hold um, interviews and we met with uh, former residents. And this is a photograph of a early um, reunion. So I showed you that little closet. And this is a photograph from the 1940s, which gives you an idea of what what these closets look like. Children didn't own their own clothes, right? I mean, this is a state institution. Um, in the evening, they would put their, hang their clothes up. In the morning, they would put the clothes on. Hopefully they have the same clothes, but that wasn't guaranteed. You notice the variety of clothes here. Um, most of these are donations. Uh, state didn't buy clothing for the kids, but, but people, citizens donated lots and lots of things. Um, here's a scene in the morning, a bathroom scene. Um, again, different image from what you would think. Kids getting their hair combed. Um, here's a scene of an interior scene. Um, beds, you can see on every bed there's a, a toy. And uh, the children, some of the children brought these toys home. And so we have people telling us about how their grandmother, the only object she has from the state home is a teddy bear. And you get the sense of what that meant. Um, here's a scene in the 1830s, um, tainted food, a bunch of people, several of them died. Um, things are getting better, but this is just an internal scene. Uh, this is an outline of what people ate. Uh, this, is, this is how the state presents it, right? This is how the state sees uh, they, they published their, their food um, menus. And here's a song sung by Robert and William Washington. This gives you an idea of what the kids thought about their food. Um, you know, I'm forever washing dishes, dirty dishes in the sink. The oatmeal is stuck and it tastes like muck. And I have it had before, before. And then along comes Mrs. McKay and she says, hey, hey, Mrs. McKay was one of the women who maintain one of the cottages. If you don't wash those dishes, you'll stay in the house all day. So um, yeah, Robert and William Wash, they're indigenous, they're indigenous members of, uh, I don't know what much background about them, but they and their family were uh, very much involved, uh, particularly their family with Royal Island Indian Council. <clears throat> and uh, the, the Washington family, an amazing family, just unbelievable. Um, so, Robert and William were twins and they had another brother. The three of them were in the institution in the 1920s and uh, they had a lot to say. Um, so here's another, this was a sign. We, we found this is a blueprint. Uh, this was given to us by the Department of Transportation uh, um, and, and it's a copy of a blueprint. And you notice it says visiting day, first Sunday of every month from one to 4.30. So you would, maybe see your parents if they came once every month for three and a half hours. So they, they described how they would sit on the rise, looking out over the, over the drive to watch for, watch for someone coming in. I mean, this was very sad. Um, so here's, here's a document I want to just rest your brains on for a minute. So, case three and case four. So we're talking about 10,000 cases in this institution, but these are some of the first ones. 
give you an idea of two, two, two girls who came in who were sisters and what happened, oops, what happened to them. Um, and you can see Doretta, she, she was put into a series of homes and she's returned, right? So she goes to Ray Littlefield's house and she's returned because they wanted a younger girl. She goes to Chas Hull's home. He's returned because his wife is ill. And finally she ends up in Hopkinton. Her sister goes to Warren Ball's house in Block Island and lives out her childhood there. And then amazingly, uh, we have a newspaper clipping of her marrying one of the wealthiest people in the town um, a few years later. It's a very, very wonderful description. So you can see the contrasting experiences that these two sisters have. Um, and you can see here too, the, mother, the, the, the dates are highlighted because these records aren't perfect. I mean, obviously the same mother, uh, somebody just, it's an entry, entry point. Nothing's perfect about record. Um, now here's Elizabeth Jones, Sarah Elizabeth Jones. Um, this is the grandmother of Julie Jennings. Julie Jennings was a student in one of my classes and um, first day of class when I was describing that I, we were doing some work at the state home is probably 2004 or something like that. Um, she said, well, I think my mother, or my grandmother might have been there. I don't know. <clears throat> and uh, so we, we found her record and she was there um, as well as her aunt, <laughs> her grand aunt. Um, now there's one man who is um, Narragansett who was at the Carlisle School <clears throat> and his last name is Jones. He was there in, in the late 18. I do not know whether they're connected. I don't know how many different Jones families there are. Um, but I, I want to mention that particular case because the federal government acknowledged the existence of the Narragansett tribe in the late 1890s by virtue of this man being, a, being named Carlisle. They wrote out Narragansett Indian. He ran away. <laughs> he did not stay at the Carlisle school. Um, so I don't know what happened, but this is a tantalizing glimpse. Um, so. One of the things we did was we ultimately, you know, worked to, to preserve, to connect, and to do all sorts of things with our, our work. Um, and I wanted to sort of end this with two images. One is this, you remember the vision I showed you in 2001 of the cottage that was falling apart. Um, this, the, the college was considering just ripping this thing down. Uh, didn't see the importance of it. Um, I have to also say that the Historical Preservation Commission in 2001 did not see the importance of the state home. Um, they allowed us to do archaeological work because it wasn't a very important place. And, you know, just go ahead. Um, and I'm not trying to demean the, Institute, the Historic Preservation Commission because I love it very much. But um, state institutions are not widely protected um, as, as bodies of knowledge by, by our state. Um, and so we secured uh, federal funding and preservation funding and uh, lots of donations um, and re re reconstructed and, and rebuilt this building. And so now it's surrounded by uh, the Richard Hillman Memorial Garden. And here we are in the dedication and that's Richard's son, and people are um, ha happy. This is how we think memories should be perhaps presented. And here's some images of people in the cottage itself. Um, just taking in the, uh, the memory of this place. Need, I, I, I sort of hesitate to conclude on this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, I just want to emphasize that in 1944, there were um, 3,000 children who were under state custody. 
Uh, plus, in, because this is during the war, you had a lot of mothers who were getting aid because of their need for, for, for assistance. Um, more, more recently, we have over 3,000 children still in custody. We don't have a state home anymore, but we have group homes and residential facilities and foster care homes. And those are the remnants of what was created at the state home. So the foster care system, what we have in place right now, all developed at the state home, um, which we can talk about. And this of course is what we see right down at the border in Texas. So we have, federal actions going on. And this is one of the institutions that was created to house those children. And if you look at it and you see the residential and the recreation, the food and the various kinds, you say, why that looks just like <laughs> any other state institution or federal institution has been created for children over the last hundred years. So that's the visual side of, uh, I have to say. And, uh, Thank you, Pierre. That was very wonderful, wonderful um, presentation, thorough and um, in depth. I, I think, you know, one of the questions you asked at the end was um, how should these places be remembered? I'm wondering if people have comments to put in the chat on how they think that these places should be remembered. Mm, I, I, yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll share a thought of my own to get people going. You know, I think that we really need to, I think one, commend you on saving one of those buildings and being able to have a place that a story could be told and, and to document those oral histories because I think that people don't realize the impact of these places on, on children and families and, and, and community as a whole. And so when we think of the federal boarding school system, the state school, um, you know, incarceration, um, especially incarceration that has really been strategically done to certain communities, um, often communities of color, but I'll go with communities of poverty, um, and how that is so impactful on our on our families and on our communities and how it is part of the system of conquest in order to eradicate people's power um, and and to in the full sense gain control of the land and the resources which ties right back. Um, it's really interesting. You mentioned a lot of different laws that brought these things into place, but it's also laws that took them out of place as well, like the Indian Child Welfare Act, as an example, 1978. Um, th those kinds of programs, um, the Indian Religious Freedom Act, which was also 1978, um, when you're thinking about the federal boarding school system and its intent to uh, homogenize indigenous people into quote unquote mainstream American life and to uh, eradicate that indigeneity um, of the people in order to eradicate and forcibly assimilate them into uh, quote unquote society. These are all really powerful um, pieces of legislation and, and we're really trying to ensure the continuation and implementation of the legislation that is meant to correct those wrongs from history. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things, I mean, we, we, we not only um, saved that building, but the, uh, the East Campus is largely now on the National Register of Historic Places. So we, we also, I think, um, saved the landscape. Mm -hmm. which, which I think is important. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the children would, would say things to us, or well, they weren't children when they were saying this. They were people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. They would say, well, you know, we would go out and we would play in, in out by um, Holy Rock. And, uh, you know, there's this big rock in the middle of the woods. And, and 
you know, it's not the kind of thing that you would think, oh, well, that, that really is worthy of saving. But when you, when you do field work around it, you discover all of these toys and you think, oh my goodness, this really was a, a place, you know, or there's, there's a, uh, there's a fence that was built in 1974 because by the late 19s, by the, by the early 1970s, the local area had grown up and people really didn't, they didn't want the state home at there anymore. And they didn't want the kids there. And so the state to placate the, uh, the neighborhood, they built this, this fence around the institution. Um, but when you go and look at it, it's all cut up and there are all these pathways through it, you know? And I remember talking to uh, uh, a woman who, uh, who was from California and came out several times because she was, had been at the institution. And she said, well, yeah, no, of course not. There's no way they could keep us you know, from, from breaking free. Um, so I look at this beaten up fence with all these slits through it and I think I see this document of liberty <laughs> and freedom but you know it's awfully hard to protect things like that very hard very much so if there's anyone that has a question and wants to just unmute they're welcome to do so um, we have a, a few maybe two or three more minutes for question and answer um, there is a comment here. It's fascinating to see what happens to reform movements, to look at the institutional founding as episodes of work to make something better, like getting kids out of asylums and into children's homes, in parentheses, and to see what happens to those reforms. It's humbling for all of us to think carefully and critically about how we go about changing the world, changing in quotes. I, I think, you know, Pratt believed he was doing the right thing by, you know, quote unquote, killing the Indian and saving the man through this forced assimilative practices. But we all know now that that experiment was not necessarily a positive experience for the majority of indigenous children that went through it, particularly in those early days of the boarding school system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, there's boarding schools nearby in Connecticut. There were religious boarding schools, industrial schools. There were, you know, Dartmouth was an indigenous school, you know, in the early days. Um, these are all just here in this Northeast corridor. There's many, many of them in across the area that were impacting indigenous children. Um, and, and part of that whole um, indenture system as well, because children would go to the school forced and then they would have to do outings during the sort of time off that would act as an indenture as a domestic household or some kind of skill set whether that was carpentry or masonry or um you know blacksmithing or what have you they would do that during their outing times and basically serve as an indenture in the households of the white families um, and then go back to the school because as, as um, Pierre mentioned, you know, many of these um, indenture circumstances were well into like 30 years old. Well, that was true for kids that were also going to these schools where mm -hmm. they were taken and they were put in the school and then kept there. And keep in mind, how did the poverty begin? The poverty began with, in you know, with the conquest and forced colonization and the urbanization and industrialization of this country in essence, but the, the poverty was created as Roger Williams was quoted earlier about certain things. He also spoke to our lack of poverty in those days and for our whole community. Um, and so when you think about this, the poverty was created the conquering power created the poverty and then they solved the poverty, quote unquote, by taking our children and putting them in these schools or taking our people and putting them in indentured situations and basically gave free labor to their economy through this. Yeah. Yeah. These, these, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's so, it, you know, people with, with, perhaps good motives you know you, you you hear it as someone wrote the rhetoric you hear the rhetoric it's it's good motives um but they don't 
don't really think through the consequences of what they're doing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when just just to talk about Buffum Chase for one second, I mean, she created this institution. She was so optimistic about it, and, and then in in 1890, this is just five years after the institution was established. There's a there's an inquiry, a Senate inquiry, because of abuse at the state home. You know, so five years into it, you have this inquiry of abuse, and um, when you when you look at the visitation records, she went back and back and back to. I mean, 18, 18 She was at that institution constantly. You could you could you could sense from it that she was just she. She did not like this, you know, like, oh, my God, I've created this thing and look what's happening. Um, and, and so they said, they said, you know, the Senate said, you know, you, you, you can't beat children and, unless you have another adult with you, right? Um, you have to feed the children. You can't, you can't, they can't suffer from malnutrition. You can't overwork the children. You can't, they're not laborers, they're children. Um, and and they also they also said you can't um, you can't lock these children up you cannot put them in solitary confinement which were all of the accusations in 1890. So when we look at the um, when we look at the blueprints of the new buildings built in 1950, what do we find in the basement? We find in the basement these isolation rooms for for confiscating children. Despite the fact that the state said no, 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 they still had it. And this was the kind when we when we talked to people, you know, they would say things like, "Oh, I remember when I was, you know, stuck in a closet." I mean, this is 1950 or 60. We're talking about so these things just persist despite, you know, I don't know. Good so I know we're we're running out of time, but there was one question here. Uh, so I'm going to use that as our last one. It was um, the idea around the goal being to have for children to grow up and have useful occupations. From your research and the knowledge that you have, uh, Pierre, what were some of the occupations that some of the kids may have eventually taken up based on what they learned at the school? What was the common goal? Well, I mean, it, you know. There was a farm at the school, so uh, early on they were trained to be to be farmers, you know, and you know they would be sent off to people's ho homes or farms to to do farm work. I I I think I think that whole happened. The 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 young ladies, the the girls were you know they learned seamstressing and I mean the sort of stuff. Um, so, so basically, people were trained to work in industrial settings. Work in factories, um, and uh, a, a lot of the people um, that that I, I talked with, you know, the first thing they they did was perhaps go into the military. Mm -hmm. you Thank know? you. Yeah, that gives us a well-rounded understanding of the kinds of jobs that they could have coming out of that. Well, I know as much as this is so interesting, we're running out of time. So first, I want to thank Pierre for sharing with us today and thank all of you for joining us for this literature and author culture conversations. I have just a couple of quick announcements. Um, our next session of literature and culture author conversations is scheduled for Tuesday, December 14th. Um, we will be with guests from the West Wark Public Library sharing one of our collaborations. And it's a project that became a book project voice. It's called Voices of Wharf and Weft. And it was written by Indigenous authors um, in, as part of this partnership. So we hope you join us and check that out. Um, we would also like you to know that um, we have, we will, this is recorded. So we will put it in the, uh, it'll be in our YouTube page. So if you're not uh, familiar with our YouTube page, I just popped it in the chat along with our events page where you can sign up for um, the next literature and author culture conversations. But you also can join us for our traditional ecological knowledge walk or TEK walk with Matt Bigos. And we're going to be gathering materials and learning about tool making that Saturday, December 4th. Um, from 2 to 4 p.m. And if you're not aware, the Away From Home uh, American Indian Boarding School Stories exhibit is happening at 95 Upper College Road, Kingston, Rhode Island. Um, and it's from Friday, January 7th uh, 
it's Tuesdays through Saturdays, 10 to 4 p.m., except for the, the major holidays like Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. The rest of the time, um, we're, avail we're available there. So I want to thank you for that. Of course, we're still booking uh, museum programs, group tours, uh, school and virtual programs. So um, feel free to bring your group to our organization. And then if you are thinking about holiday shopping, don't forget to stop by our museum store or support us on our online store, um, which is um, really great. And hopefully our museum tech will uh, pop the link for the store in the chat because we've updated it since I last used this sheet of paper. Um, and that'll get you directly there. Um, we have about 35 local indigenous artists. So you can support indigenous artists because they get 80% of the proceeds. Um, and you can support the museum as well. So thank you so much um, for um, Oh, it says uh, some folks from friends might be joining us soon at the away from home. So I'm excited about that. And then uh, Silver Moon, thank you so much for being our museum tech tonight. Thank uh, you, Silver Moon. Who just popped in the chat, our tomaquagmuseumshop.org uh, link. Um, so thank you for that. And um, thank you again, all of you for joining us today. And we hope to see you. In, in December at our next literature and culture author conversation. Thank you again, Pierre. This was um, quite informative. I'm sure everyone's going away, um, maybe not necessarily uplifted, but <laughs> empowered with knowledge about this school and, and the impacts that it has on native and non-native children alike. Um, it was encompassing many people. So with that, I'd like to say good night, Winnie Nakan, and hope to see you soon. Peace, Ganache. Thank you.